Hi, uh, good evening everyone. So now this week we are back and we'll discuss from now onwards one biologic every week, one biological every week and I hope you have gone through the video on pathomechanisms in psoriasis and uh, you have you at least have some basic idea about how different cytokines work in tandem to cause a psoriatic plaque or the disease known as psoriasis, the chronic uh, immune mediated disease, the psoriasis. So because if you have that kind of background of cytokines, uh, we'll be able to better understand where each and every biologic work and what are the subtle differences amongst them or what are the certain, certain advantages of one biologic over other and when should we choose one type of biologic rather than the other type of biologics. And to understand each and every biological, we will start first with adalimumab. So this week, drug is adalimumab. And we'll discuss that short in a, in a short manner. And we'll try to find out uh, how exactly adalimumab works, the, if the uses of adalimumab in dermatology, <clears throat> dosing regimens, and how different uh, type of uh, side effects it has, and what to do if your patient has that certain kind of side effects, what are the black box warnings? Somewhat a good introduction to a drug known as adalimumab, one of the one of the best drugs in psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, recently FDA approved for uh, hydrodenatis separativa. So uh, with that, let's start our short discussion on adalimumab in dermatology. Now, adalimumab, <coughs> adalimumab is first human IG-1 monoclonal antibody, okay? So, it's human derived. So, uh, if let's say this is the antibody with variable and constant regions, the whole molecule is derived through a human a process in which human cells and human protein molecules are used, okay? Now, uh, it is against, it targets the tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF alpha. And just a reminder that TNF alpha is of two types. It can be a soluble one or it could be a membrane bound one. And adalimumab acts against both of these types of TNF alpha with soluble attachment also and with membrane attachment also. So both of these TNF alphas are uh, inhibited or somewhat uh, neutralized by this monoclonal antibody. Now it was introduced for use in 2003 and like all different drugs, thus the indication first was rheumatoid arthritis, followed by ulcerative colitis, then there was their uh, pediatric ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, angst pond. So these were the initial FDA approved indication for the use of Dalimua. And like a lot of our drugs, it gradually made its way uh, to the further treatment of psoriasis. From all the, all this kind of arthritis, it shifted to so, sorry, yeah. It shifted to psoriatic arthritis and from psoriatic arthritis to psoriasis. Clear? So these were the FDA approved indications initially, and in uh, uh, first it got approved for the treatment of psoriatic arthritis, then got approved for treatment of psoriasis, and then subsequently it got approved for hydrogenase separativa. And since it is very difficult for me to pronounce this long word, I'll use the short form HS for it from henceforth. So FD approval is there for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis and HS uh, in dermatology. There are multiple non-dermatological indications also. And for HS, it received it FD approval in 2015. So this could be a good viva question. And also many of the articles don't mention HS as an FDA approved indication because they are older articles. So it has up, got approval uh, from FDA in 2015, okay. Uh, it comes in various forms. Initially it was IV form in the form of vials and the vial doses were roughly around 40 milligram per ml concentration. Some vials also had 40 milligram per 0.8 ml. So we, so initially when it was available, like any other any other drug, we used to take it out by calculating the dose and then inject into the patient. But now it comes in pre-filled syringes or pens. So syringes are like any syringe. It's a glass syringe. It's filled with the requisite amount which is mentioned on the label. It can be 80 milligram, 40 milligram. It comes in 40 milligrams. 
and pens. The pen is that it, it's more of a self-injecting mechanism. So pens have a self-injecting mechanism. You just have to press a button and the whole drug gets delivered. And pre-filled syringe, you have to push the plunger to deliver the drug. That is the only difference. And nowadays, it is mostly available as pens. Even pre-filled syringes have been slowly being phased out. So adalimumab has been indicated for the treatment of adult patients with moderate to severe chronic plaque psoriasis who are a candidate for systemic therapy or phototherapy and when other systemic therapies are either medically less appropriate or might have failed their treatment. Okay. Now remember that other immunosuppressive agents do take part in that TNF alpha induced pathway which we have studied, studied in the pathomechanical psoriasis video. So if they are not working, there's a high chance that these biologicals will also not show that benefit. The benefit of using biologicals generally and specifically Dalimumab is somewhat of its safer nature and the dosing regimen is somewhat reduced. But if you compare the dosing regimen with methotrexate, you might find it's, it's nearly the same. It's a weekly or alternate weekly dosing regimen with an additional disadvantage of this drug being very costly as compared to methotrexate. So always remember in deciding any one kind of drug, keep your patient in the loop and decide what's benefit beneficial for them. Okay. In pharmacokinetics of the of the drug, it has a high affinity and selectivity for TNF alpha. It binds both soluble and the membrane bound form of TNF alpha. The bioavailability is about sixty four percent. And after injection, remember that the injection is in is uh, through the subcutaneous route. There is also mention of an intravenous route, but nowadays it is not used. It's mostly sub subcutaneous. So when the drug is injected subcutaneously, it is absorbed via the lymphatics. The peak concentration, some books mention 1 to 2 weeks, some books mention 131 plus minus 56 hours. So this is also mentioned somewhere. 1 to 2 weeks is a good enough answer if you want to answer in your viva. T half is about 14 days, some books mention 14 to 20 days and I saw in one book it was around 162 days. Now uh, this, this is a huge discrepancy. But most of the references, including the package insert for Dalimumab, mentioned it as two weeks. Okay. After stopping Dalimumab, it takes about 160 days to get out of the system. So maybe that is why this was mentioned as T half. But the package insert and multiple other articles mentioned two, uh, two weeks as T half. So a good answer would be 14 days. Action takes about one to seven days after administration. The moment the administration happens, after one week, you can see the clinical benefit of the drug. Now, remember that adalimumab requires a certain higher dose when you are giving it at the first time with a subsequent lower maintenance dose, which is being repeated either weekly or two weekly. Okay. So, we just need an initial extra immunosuppressive effect of adalimumab uh, at the first dose. And then subsequently, we maintain that immunosuppressive effect by using a lower dose, but continuously every week or every two weeks. Okay. How does adalimumab act? It acts by binding to TNF alpha and then it prevents its attachment to the receptors. So let's say if this is the cell surface, okay, and this is the receptor of TNF alpha. Now remember that TNF alpha has two receptors, you have P55 and you have P75, two receptors for TNF alpha and both of these are blocked by adalimumab, okay. So this is the receptor and this is let's say TNF alpha, let's make it square, okay. This usually gets attached to the receptor and then using multiple pathways, major one being NFK beta. It leads, it binds to the DNA response elements leading to translation of various inflammatory cytokines. This is the normal pathway. Now what adalimumab does is, let's say this is adalimumab. It binds to the soluble TNF alpha and prevents its attachment to its receptor. And this pathway does not happen. And because of that, the translation of inflammatory molecules don't happen and there is decrease in the cytokine level which causes inflammation, clear? Along with acting with tandem with the complement system, it lyses the TNF alpha expressing cells. 
Now some of the cells can express TNF alpha on their cell surface and these are more like antigen presenting cells number one. Number two it, it, it is because of attachment of TNF alpha to the membrane bound. I told you that there are two types of TNF alpha soluble and membrane bound. So when these are membrane bound TNF alpha adalimumab along with the complement system attaches itself to the membrane bound TNF alpha thereby increasing the apoptotic cascade apoptotic cascade and because of that the cell dies okay and these cells what are and what kind of cells are these these are mostly T cells and all the immune mediating cells so these cells die and thus the immune cytokines are also decreased because of that so first it decreases by inhibiting the attachment to its receptor and decreasing NFK beta decreasing translation of cytokines it decreases inflammation. Other way it does that is it binds to membrane bound TNF alpha leading to apoptosis of cell. Clear? So after binding to these two types of TNF alpha, it decreases inflammatory cytokines like 6 matrix metalloprotein proteinases, CRP, ESR, and acute phase reactants. Now these are those cytokines which are significantly decreased by dilemma, along with other cytokines like interleukin. 17 interleukin 23 but interleukin 17 and 23 are more of an action of decrease in tnf alpha rather than adalimumab itself okay so the fact that adalimumab uh, suppresses tnf alpha action leads to suppression of all these inflammatory cytokines and thus the inflammation is curtailed here it is decreased Now let's revise what TNF alpha actually does. So TNF alpha is one of the major mediator. If you uh, want a revision, just go back and see the psoriasis pathomechanism video. So it's a major mediator. It's a major upstream mediator of uh, psoriatic pathomechanism. Downstream mediators include interleukin 23 and interleukin uh, interleukin 70. Okay. So TNF alpha is a major upstream mediator of uh, pathomechanism and psoriasis. It is upregulated in psoriatic patient and the serum levels of TNF alpha correlates with severity of disease. It is secreted by a wide variety of cells. Now remember that TNF alpha have its action or secretion by nearly all cells of the body except RBCs. So RBCs are the cells who do not react with TNF alpha and thus RBCs don't release any inflammatory cytokine. So when any cell gets activated either by autoantigen or by exogenous antigen, it releases TNF alpha and then TNF alpha acts as an autocrine in, in an autocrine fashion. Autocrine means it will act on the cell itself, which the cell uh, which the the cell which is secreted TNF alpha, the TNF alpha attaches to the same cell and increases the secretion of TNF alpha. So it's a positive food, positive feedback mechanism. Along with that, TNF alpha attaches itself to various other cells namely dendrit uh, den dendritic cells and these dendritic cells remember now you can see that dendritic cells are responsible for the production of tnf alpha and when tnf alpha attaches itself again to those dendritic cells this leads to their further activation and production of interleukin 23 and this interleukin 23 downstream will activate th17 cells and these th17 cells will secrete interleukin 17 and this interleukin 17 along with interleukin 23 will form the major axis of pathomechanism psoriasis. Again, I request you to go back and see the video on psoriasis pathomechanism and everything will be clear. Okay. Additionally, TNF alpha upregulates intracellular adhesion molecules and surface endothelial cells. So these are the wall of our vessels which are made by endothelial cell. It increases the attachment molecules and because of this attachment molecules, the circulating T cell gets attached to this and then using the process of diapodesis, it goes in between the gaps of endothelial cells and reach the skin where inflammation is taking place. When it reaches there, it releases all sorts of cytokines leading to a psoriatic plaque. It's chemotactic for neutrophils. So it calls neutrophils from the circulation to the skin. And that is why in psoriasis you see micromundro abscesses or cogos abscesses in the epidermis. Neutrophils have no reason to be in epidermis normally. Somebody has called them and these somebodies are either the, uh, TN the TNF alpha or other cytokines. 
other cytokines like interleukin 17 and 23 are also chemotactic for uh, neutrophils and if you remember from the video on, on psoriasis the CCR6 and CCR20 axis is also chemotactic for neutrophils. So all of these signals are calling neutrophils from circulation to the skin so that they may reach the skin and form these microabscesses and cocosabscesses. It also leads to keratinocyte proliferation which clinically is seen as scales the, and histopathologically as acanthosis, papillomatosis and all. It also stimulates interleukin-22 receptor and, and, and also additionally interleukin-20 family of cytokines which includes IL-20, IL-22, IL-23. They have nearly similar actions and because of stimulation of these all cytokines it leads to the pathology in psoriasis. So naturally adalimumab which will block TNF alpha will block this whole axis and the psoriatic inflammation is taken care of. Clear? Now just to summarize that TNF alpha acts on endothelial cells, it increases the adhesion molecules and also vascular related growth factors. By increasing the adhesion molecules, it increases the cell migration and infiltration. So migration is also increased and infiltration is also increased. When vascular endothelial growth factors increase, it leads to angiogenesis and this is why we see dilated tortuous capillaries, dermal capillaries in the biopsy of psoriasis and also on scraping clinically, we see this pinpoint bleeding. Clear? TNF alpha acts on macrophages, thereby increasing the pro-inflammatory cytokines secreted by those macrophages and these cytokines further increases inflammation. TNF alpha also acts on keratinocyte and increases the pro inflammatory cytokine, and this cytokine increases the proliferation of scales and acanthosis, which we have discussed in the last slide. It also acts on hepatocytes, and in hepatocyte, it increases acute phase reactants. Now, remember that acute phase, phase, uh, sorry, acute phase response or acute phase reactants, which further increase CRP and ESR like inflammatory markers, the C reactive proteins. These are all created or manufactured by the liver. So TNF alpha action hepatocyte to further increase these acute phase reactants like and further increasing CRP and ESR. Now the usage of adalimumab. Adalimumab is used. Let's let's divide the use in two parts: FD approved and non-FD approved. So FD approved usages are only two: moderate to severe psoriasis in adult patients and moderate to severe HS in adult patients. Clear? All other uses of adalimumab are non-FD approved as of today, as of 2023. Okay. Now in psoriasis, you give, in psoriasis, give a, it, sorry, just a second. Yeah. In psoriasis, you give an additional in, initial dose of 80 milligrams. So each box is 40. Okay. So you it, on first visit on day zero, you give 40 milligram. That means total of 80 milligram day zero, 40 milligram into two. You give 80 milligrams initial dose. Then you take a one week gap. You give 40 milligram. And then after every two weeks, you give 40 milligram. Again, I'm repeating on day zero, it's 40 milligram. On day eight, I think I'll have to say again. On day zero, it is 80 milligram, 40 milligram into two. Take a break of seven days. On day eight is 40 milligram only. Take a break of two weeks. Then again, 40 milligram after two weeks, 40 milligram after two weeks, 40 milligram after two weeks, and it will continue. Okay. So for psoriasis, it is 80 milligram initial dose followed by 40 milligram after one week and then after every two weeks you can continue with 40 milligram till the disease is in uh, shows remission. In psoriatic arthritis and this one is easy to remember it is just 40 milligram every two weeks 40 milligram every alternate week simple regimen remember okay so again repeating for psoriasis 80 milligram at day zero wait for one week give 40 milligram then after every two weeks you give 40 milligram for psoriatic arthritis it is 40 milligram every two weeks okay 
Now for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, you give adalimumab for at least 16 weeks. And if at the end of 16 weeks, there is no response or inadequate response, it's a good idea to reconsider your therapeutic modality. So articles mention that if, let me just get rid of everything. If at the end of 16 weeks, your PASI 75, that means 75 reduction uh, in PASI from baseline. So if baseline PASI was X, after that it should be 0.25X after 16 weeks. If PASI 75 reduction is seen in 70, uh, has is usually seen in 70% of patients. That means 77 out of 10 patients will show a reduction of PASI 75 after 16 weeks of usage of adalimumab. Similarly, at the end of 16 weeks, PASI 90, that means 90% reduction of in PASI from baseline will be seen in 45% of patients. If that data is not matching at the end of 16 weeks, you may increase the dosing frequency of adalimumab. That means here we were giving every two weeks. You may consider giving it every week. If at the end of four months of giving every week, total four months, means from the starting of the adrenal therapy, if after 16 weeks, that means approximate four months, you can increase the frequency of every week and then after every week giving adalimumab for four months, there is no response, stop adalimumab. There is no reason to continue with adalimumab, okay? So I hope I have been clear for psoriasis. For HS, so three types of regimens have been advised. You have adults. You have more than 12 years, 12 years and more than 60 kg. And you have uh, more than 12 years, less than 60 kg. I think it's, yeah, it's 30 to 60 kg. Okay. Less than 12 years, it is not been approved. So the regimens are not there. So more than 12 years, but weight between 30 to 60 kg. Since these two regimens are same, so we'll discuss it in two formations. More than 12 years of age and more than 60 kg. Clear? More than 12 includes adult patients, more than 18. Okay? So the dosing regimen is 160 milligram at day 0. At day 0, you have 160 milligram. Remember that each box is 40. At day 0, it's 160 milligram. Take a break of 2 weeks. Give 80 milligram. Okay? Then give 40 milligram every 2 weeks. Okay, so it's 160 milligram on day 0, take a break of 2 weeks, give 80 milligram, take a break of 2 weeks, then every week 40 milligram gets continued. So 40 milligram weekly, 40 milligram weekly, 40 milligram weekly, it's getting continued till the disease comes in remission. Clear? If the weight is less, between 30 to 60 kg, you decrease the dose. It's very easy to remember, 160 loading dose will become 80 milligram, half of it. Okay, will after one week we'll give 40 milligram and then 40 milligram every two weeks. Okay, remember that adalimumab comes in pre-filled syringes of 40 milligram. Okay, so it's difficult to go less than 40. However, pre-filled syringes of adalimumab is available in the doses of 20 milligram, also in 10 milligram, but mostly it is available as 40 milligram pre-filled injections. So, you can remember it by this way that since 40 milligrams is available, instead of halving the dose, you increase the interval. So, here you were giving 40 milligram every week, here you will give 40 milligram every two weeks. Okay, so if weight is less, it's between 30 to 60 kg. You start with 80 milligram loading dose, after one week, you give 40 milligram, and then after every two weeks, you keep on continuing 40 milligram till HS is in remission. Okay. Remember that individually adalimumab has not found to be much effective. So it's good idea to either combine with other antibiotics 
and in the end consider surgery for the removal of affected glands remember that surgery can be in few patients affected patients can be the only treatment which might help them it's a very morbid treatment it's a difficult treatment to even think of let alone to undergo a surgery but remember that adalimumab individually may not be able to help your patient of hs and you have to combine with antibiotics till the permanent discharge and everything gets uh, under control and remember that significant sinus stage and significant discharging stage of hs especially when the sinuses are interconnecting and i'm talking about early stage 3 of hs adalimumab may not be the an effective modality it's a better idea to start with antibiotics and consider surgery for removal of all the glands that would help your patient more now other uses remember that tnf alpha is a very important cytokine for intracytoplasmic or intracellular pathogens so whenever whenever a cell gets infected by a pathogen and that pathogen goes inside the cell and resides the cell will secrete man, many chemokines and cytokines one of the most important chemokine or cytokine is interferon alpha now what interferon alpha does is it's it kind of marks the infected cell that this cell is not good it, it is not okay we have to kill and destroy the cell okay so it's a marker let's say it's like a suicide marker okay it's a self harm marker and let's say i am a cell i get infected by a pathogen i don't know how to deal with that pathogen i will engulf it keep it inside me and send signals to all the policemen cells like t cells macrophages natural killer cells that hey i am infected i am not able to deal with this pathogen please kill me so that you can kill the pathogen also and this message is shared by interferon alpha and you and we will discuss it just in brief when we will be discussing igra igra or uh, using using a map in the patient of latent tuberculosis okay now this tnf alpha which is secreted by cells by the in, intracytoplasmic pathogen infected cells this tnf alpha is going to recruit a lot of activated dendritic cells and macrophages and these macrophages form what is known as granuloma so these epithelial cells and macrophages they get activated and instead of killing the intracellular pathogen they kind of form a ring around it and and keep it trapped okay and this entrapment this collection of activated entrapment forms granuloma so in short tnf alpha is necessary for granuloma formation so all the granulomatous disorders which we see in dermatology has been in various isolated case reports treated with adalimumab okay so let's start with these disorders first is sarcoidosis individual case reports are present mainly cutaneous sarcoidosis responds very well pulmonary sarcoidosis have also been responding Uh, and also this one i think i have to take a support of uh, bone involvement with pulmonary involvement that to respond by dalimumab the regimen that these case reports use is 40 mg every week but remember that dalimumab has also been reported to precipitate sarcoidosis to cause sarcoidosis in patients so it's better idea to use it as one of the last resort if required or whether your patient profile is suiting very well to dalimumab okay other disorders which is which have been using an adalimumab is neutrophilic dermatosis mainly bursets where the oral and the uh, eye manifestation uveitis and oral manifestations respond very good to adalimumab so that's one more drug which can be used in bursets other neutrophilic dermatosis like sweets have been using adalimumab with good response Pyoderma gangrenosum has been using adalimumab with good response. The regimen uses 80 mg weekly for the first two weeks and then maintain on 40 mg weekly. Now remember that these regimens are not at all prescribed regimen. These are all experiment uh, experimental regimen based on pharmacokinetics of the drug, pathology of the disease they are treating and they are more or less haphazard. So these are only isolated case reports. These are not guidelines. So remember that 
Other dermatoses are pemphigus, vasculitis, multicentric reticular steratocytosis. Remember that since TNF alpha is necessary for granuloma formation, TNF alpha inhibitors can be used to dissolve these kind of granulomas. Now, granulomas, let's say if it is formed because of an infected condition like tuberculosis, then giving TNF alpha inhibitors is a very wrong thing because you are kind of lowering the body defenses in entrapping tuberculosis. Okay? So we should not give tuberculosis in those granulomatous disorders where the infective pathology is considered. If granulomas are because of a non-infected etiology like sarcoidosis, adalimumab can be considered as a treatment modality. Clear? So we have discussed so, uh, discussed uh, mechanism of action of adalimumab, uses of adalimumab, what exactly is adalimumab, how does it act, what is TNF alpha. So let's discuss the practical aspects or the bedside aspects of dilemma. How to store the pre-filled syringes or the uh, pen, the pen of a dilemma. So it has to be stored in refrigerator, the temperature, the interval is 2 degree to 8 degrees Celsius. It has to be stored in the original carton. Do not remove from the original carton. It has to be protected from light. Do not freeze and do not use a frozen. So if your adalimumab pen is frozen for whatever reason, do not use it. Even if you thaw the syringe and it becomes liquid again, still don't use it. Okay. Do not use after the expiration date. That goes without saying. You, must, you may store at room temperature but only maximum 14 days. So a cap of 14 days has been put if you are storing at room temperature. Otherwise, it has to be stored in refrigerator in the interval range of 2 degrees to 8 degrees Celsius. Throw away the pen if it is not used within 14 days at room temperature. Okay, so you may store at room temperature, especially. Now, remember, these are pre filled pens. And pre filled pens are manufactured because we want the patients to take themselves. Okay, so let me clarify what I'm saying. Adalimumab has to be taken under supervision of a physician. First few doses are always administered by the physician. Attempts are made to, under, to make the patient understand how to take Adalimumab by themselves so that they can take it without the physician's help. If they are taking with the, without the physician's help, they must know how to store Adalimumab and how to administer themselves. If they are traveling and the facility for refrigeration is not available, they may store a dilemmab at room temperature, but maximum 14 days. After that, that has to be discarded at all cost. Clear? Now, what are the baseline investigations that we do? CBC, LFT, KFT, ESR, CRP goes without saying. Urine routine microscopy goes without saying to look at all the infective pathology, if there's any. Monto test. Interferon gamma release assays such as quantiferon gold test and chest radiograph. These are essential. We have to rule out two types of tuberculosis, either active tuberculosis or latent tuberculosis infection, LTBI. We have to rule out. And these, these investigations help us to do that so that we know if the patient is infected with tuberculosis, especially in a country which has such a high prevalence of TB and where the vaccination effect lasts roughly about 10 years. So we all have received BCG when we were born. Okay. But after the age of 10, the immunogenicity of that vaccine significantly wanes and everybody is at, at a risk of acquiring tuberculosis, especially people who come in contact with TB patients. So it's better to screen for tuberculosis infection and to find. Now, if the patient is symptomatic, it is known as active tuberculosis. We have to treat for tuberculosis first, then consider TNF alpha inhibitors. And it's a good idea not to consider TNF alpha inhibitors in those patients. Consider other modalities. If the patient is completely asymptomatic, but immune test like Monto test, which looks at the immune memory of the immunity regarding tuberculosis infection, or IGRA test, which tells us about the uh, activity of T cell in response to TB antigens. These tests uh, look for latent tuberculosis infection. Remember, in this, the patient does not have any kind of symptoms. And it's a good idea to give prophylaxis for tuberculosis and then consider anti-TNF alpha inhibitors if you really have to consider.
viral markers like hep B, hep C and HIV has to be ruled out. Any signs of infection, if there's any sign of infection, you have to find, for, for example, if patient has fever, get a blood culture done. Maybe the fever is not because of psoriatic inflammation, it's because of an infection. Get a blood culture done. Okay? Um, you may consider getting a procalcitonin done, a high sensitivity CRP to be done. Okay? So we have to rule out any sign of infection. Remember that Adalimumab carries two black box warning as of now. One is serious infections and others are malignancies. So remember that any kind of serious infection has to be ruled out before even considering anti-TNF-alpha therapy. How to administer Adalimumab? If you are storing, if, if not, you are storing Adalimumab in the refrigerator and the interval is 2 to 8 degrees Celsius, again reminding, you take it out and keep it so that the temperature reaches the room temperature. You have to wait for 15 to 30 minutes before injecting. Let the Adalimumab drug warm up a bit till the room temperature. It should not be cold. So just bring it out of the fridge and keep it at room temperature at 15 to 30 minutes and it will be okay for injecting. Do not remove the cap or cover. The cap has to be removed just before injecting. So you remove the cap and inject. No interval in between. You inspect the syringe for any kind of particulate matter. That means if any particles can be seen or if there's a haziness to it or any kind of discoloration prior to ad subcutaneous administration. If there's any discoloration, any particulate matter, any particles you can see in the drug, you have to discard it. No other drugs discard it. Remember that and we'll be showing you a picture of pen in the next slide. In every Adalima pen, there is a window. It's a glass window here in which you can examine the drug. So just tilt it and see if there's any kind of particulate matter. If you find any particulate matter, discard it. Now these pre-filled syringes don't have any preservatives. Okay. So if there's any unused portion is left, that unused has to be discarded. For example, if you have a 40 milligram, uh, 40 milligram syringe and you have to go 20 milligram for whatever reason and you use, think that you can use half of 20 and half of 20 another or you have a pre-filled syringe of 80 milligram and you think that I'll give half of the syringe right now and half of the syringe one week or two weeks afterwards, that is not going to happen. This drug does not have any preservatives. If any amount is left, better to discard the remaining amount. Clear? Inject full amount, okay? By injecting full amount means if the drug is 40 milligram in one syringe, inject the whole 40 milligram. Clear? You have to use separate sites in thighs or abdomen and rotate the injection site. We'll discuss this point when we, when we will be discussing the injecting sites. If the site, if the local area is tender, bruised, red or hard, do not inject at that site. Now remember, that inject site reactions is one of the most common adverse effects of adalimumab injection. Roughly around 20% of the patients are going to have this. And you are injecting every two weeks. Okay. So there is a high chance that you might have to inject on the same site. And if that site is tender, bruised or red or erythematous or firm or hard, do not inject at that site. Inject at some other site. Keep on rotating the injection site. Clear? Now this is Humira pen. Humira is just the brand name of a Delium map. And it, just look at the parts of this pen. This is cap number two. It's a plum color. The word they use is plum, not purple. So it's a plum colored cap. And this, what, what is the function of this cap? This cap is to protect the button. So this is a button which will, in, this is the button which will inject the drug. And this cap prevents any accidental pressing of the button. Clear? This is a gray cap or cap number one. And what does this do? This protects the needle. So here is a needle. And this is the white needle sleeve. That means the needle is inside. The needle is somewhere at this level. And this sheath prevents any kind of accidental exposure or accidental prick by the needle. So when you are injecting, you remove this cap. You touch the skin to this sheath, you touch the skin to this sheath and then you press the cap. 
a needle this this leaf will go inside the needle will come out it will pierce it will go into subcutaneous here is the window from which you will see gradually the drug being injecting after the drug has been injected completely the whole amount of drug is injected you will see this a uh, yellow indicator at this window okay a yellow indicator at this window and that means that the whole amount of drug has been injected and then you can remove the pen clear now these are the injection sites which have been described in the package insert or dalimumab okay so the most common site is abdomen after that the anterior aspect of thighs and then if these sites are involved uh, already injected and let's say they are bruised or they are red firm and we don't want to inject on those sites we can inject at the back of the arm clear now what do we mean by rotating of injection site a good idea is divide the abdomen into four quadrants let's say this is the abdomen area this is the umbilicus so one inch around the umbilicus it's a good idea to go two inches two inches around the umbilicus is no injection site you cannot inject around it the rest area can be divided into four parts you inject first here then on next visit of injection you inject here then on next visit of injection you inject here on the next visit you inject here and by the time the first side gets healed and you can start the cycle again so whenever you are injecting a dalimumab always mention and make a good record of where you are injecting okay now injection technique when we press the first plum colored button you will hear a loud click that means injection has started you keep holding against the squeezed raised skin so let's say this is the skin of the abdomen you pinch using fingers on these two areas and raise the skin okay raise the skin between your fingers and put the pen here and inject into the subcutaneous mound so when you at let's say this is uh, let's say my this hand is the skin you touch the adalim web pen and you press the button okay you press the button and keep it pressed at least for 10 seconds this is the roughly amount taken for the entire drug to be injected and keep pressing it till you find the yellow marker and, and it stops moving that means the entire drug has been injected and you can remove the am i clear on that now this is the injection technique which is in the from the package insert you pierce uh, sorry you pinch the skin so that it creates some mound attach the pen to the mound and then push the button and keep it pressed for 10 seconds till you see the yellow marker on the window clear then you remove it and discard it in a puncture proof container it's done now before injecting you have to clean the side with a sterile swab we have okay with a sterile alcohol swab that is that was without saying please don't inject without cleaning okay and make a record of the site where you have injected now if you are using pre filled syringes remember the previous slide showed you the pen this is a pre filled syringe so you have to plunge it and the angle for the pen if this is the skin that you have pinched the angle for the pen is 90 degrees you know you could have seen in the previous photograph that is perpendicular to the skin but if it is a pre filled syringe you enter at 45 degrees okay you enter into the subcutaneous area and inject the whole amount whatever you want to inject now what are the contraindications contraindication for dalimumab the most important contraindication to take care of is infection it is a black box warning for dalimumab which is serious infections mostly the opportunistic infections now there are two kind of infection either the patient is suffering from infections and you want to give a dalimumab or the patient is not suffering from infection and you and the patient has a risk of developing infection remember that you are stopping tnf alpha from acting which is a very important cytokine in our immune system and if that happens patient have an increased risk of infection so we need to be doubly sure without before giving a dalimumab so most commonly opportunistic infections are the problem and fungal infections like aspergillosis blastomycosis candidiasis coccidiomycosis histoplasmosis legionellosis listeriosis pneumocystosis to pneumocystosis are 
usually seen in patients receiving adalimumab. And the most important opportunistic infection or adalimumab is tuberculosis, especially in our country, which is a somewhat of a high prevalent TB country. Do not combine with anakinra and abatacept. In combination with these drugs, it has been found that it seriously increases the risk of patients acquiring serious adverse events and adverse infections. So no combination with these two drugs or for that matter, no combination with other TNF-alpha inhibitor drugs is advised. Do not combine adalimumab with other TNF-alpha inhibitors. However, you may change and use different inhibitors cyclically. That means you use adalimumab for some time and then shift to let's say infliximab okay, or secoquinumab. So that can be done. Change of biologicals can be done. But do not use concurrently different type biologicals at the same time. It seriously increases the risk of adverse event. Okay. Now, if there's any infection, do not give a dilemma. Do not give. If there's any active infection, including any localized infection, treat the infection first, make the patient infection free, and then give a dilemma. Okay. If patients are above 65 years of age, uh, remember that increased age has their own side effects. So be very careful while giving adalimumab. It's better not to give and use conventional therapy in which a lot of data is available and you can easily handle those side effects. Any patient with comorbid conditions, any patient taking concomitant immunosuppressant, all these factors increases the chances of patient acquiring infections after giving adalimumab. Okay. So all these factors are going to decrease the immunity nonetheless and if you further decrease it using TNF-alpha inhibitors, you do have a serious chance of your patient lying in serious infections, in severe infections and you will be in a bit of trouble. It's a good idea not to use adalimumab if the patient is more than 65 years of age or has comorbid conditions or has to use other immunosuppressants, predominantly corticosteroid or methotrexate. So they have a very high chance of developing infections. Not to use adalimumab, at least treat the infection first and then consider using adalimumab. Now tuberculosis adalimumab, that's a very important uh, factor to keep in mind while using adalimumab, especially in a country like India, which has a very high prevalence of tuberculosis. Now it has been found that tuberculosis occurs within the eight months of treatment of adalimumab, either reactivation or new infection. The risk is increased by two times as compared to the general population. Now, IGRA conversion rate. What is IGRA conversion rate? Your patient might have uh, IGRA. IGRA is interferon gamma release assay. It's a test for latent tuberculosis infection. And uh, let's, let's have a short discussion how IGRA actually works. Now, I told you that a cell when it gets infected by a pathogen which it is unable to kill themselves, they will release various cytokines, one of them being interferon alpha. Other cytokines are also there, which, namely interferon gamma. Interferon gamma. Now, if the cell recognizes MTB, and these cells are taken out of the body inside a test tube, let's say here, and you add MTB antigens to this, mycobacterium tuberculosis antigens to this. Since these cells recognize MTB, under the action of anti, uh, antigens of MTB, they will start to again release, release interferon gamma, clear? And this spike of interferon gamma or this release of interferon gamma is measured by the test and that is why it is known as IGRA, interferon gamma release assay. It's an enzyme linked assay, it's an ELISA which takes into account how much interferon gamma is being released by the activated cell. Another, another test is TB spot which is same as IGRA, the only difference being that TB spot looks at the number of activated T cells under the presence of MTB antigens, while IGRA looks at the activated interferon gamma release by those cells. Clear? So coming back to the discussion, it occurs within the eight months starting treatment, risk is twice. IGRA conversion from positive to negative. That means if your patient has positive IGRA, 
and uh, after good therapy or uh, your igra becomes negative which can be seen in 14 to 15 percent of patients now the tnf blocking therapy makes sense now you may give no need for any serialized testing that means if igra is negative continuously testing for igra to find out whether tb is getting activated or if patient is getting infected with tb has not shown to have significant benefit so no need for serialized testing okay monto test is a good test uh, uh, it's a skin based test it is also written as tst or tubercular uh, tuberculosis uh, skin test or tuberculin skin test the cut off is 15 mm however considering if the patient is already taking immunosuppressive you may consider the cut off a bit lower at 10 mm if monto test is positive this also shows you if the patient has either active tb or latent tb and this can also guide you so multiple times interferon gamma release assay and monto test are used interchangeably to find out if the patient is has had an exposure with tuberculosis okay Uh, but sometimes some studies do say that both of these tests has to be done to increase the sensitivity and specificity of igra so first you do monto and within 3 days of doing monto you take you do igra now this is just few of the case uh, series or articles that i have read which shows that 3 day limit so take that with a pinch of salt okay so if monto test is done and it is negative it's good enough If you want to do igra, it's better to do igra within three days of doing monto. If monto is positive, that alone is good enough. Okay, you don't have to do igra. Just do a chest X-ray, take a good history of TB exposure or past TB infection. Okay. Now remember that monto test can be negative when patient is already already taking immunosuppressant because that kind of immune reactivity doesn't happen, and you may not see. Uh, the threshold of 10 mm crossing or 15 mm crossing so remember that and keep that in mind most of the patient of psoriasis are already on immunosuppressive drugs now this flow chart i found in this article and this is a good article to read and i will attach the citation for this article in the description so that people can go and read the whole article so this flow chart says that you have to in every patient considering tnf alpha inhibitor therapy take a good history of tb exposure look at the symptoms sign and get a chest x ray done if chest x ray or any of these show any indication of tb assess whether active tuberculosis occurs so if this is yes assess if any active tb is there if you find the focus of tuberculosis start anti tb therapy no need to give tnf alpha blockers clear if you do not find any active focus of tuberculosis they may have latent tb infection in that you give prophylaxis either you give i for 6 months or you give h and uh, it's not i it's h isoniazid that's what i meant either you give isoniazid for 6 months or you give isoniazid if i'm using combination therapy for 4 months that is prophylaxis okay you give preventive therapy for at least 4 weeks and then consider tnf alpha while the preventive therapy is being continued give tnf alpha inhibitors so after preventive therapy you can give anti tnf let me just change the color you can give anti tnf therapy clear if on initial past history tb exposure symptoms signs test x ray you don't find any indication you do a monto test look at the diameter ठीक है इफ द डायमीटर इज मोर देन 15 मिलीमीटर और इफ इट इज लेस देन 15 मिलीमीटर बट शोज नेक्रोसिस और इन्फ्लेमेशन और ब्लिस्टरिंग कंसीडर दिस एज एक्टिव ट्यूबोक्लोसिस एंड स्टार्ट एंटी टीबी थेरेपी क्लियर इफ इट इज मोर देन 15 और शोज सिग्निफिकेंट इन्फ्लेमेटरी एक्टिविटी गिव टीबी ट्रीटमेंट डोंट गिव एंटी टीएनएफ ओके इफ इट इज बिटवीन 10 टू 15 मिलीमीटर डू इग्रा If igra is positive, it is TB. Treat for TB. If it is negative, then no TB. Give anti TNF alpha. Clear? If it is less than ten, look at any other risk factors like TB exposure. Look at the prevalence in your country. Okay. Look at any past history of TB. Look at any history of TB uh, exposure with TB contacts. Okay. If those risk risk factors are not there, give anti TNF alpha. If it is present, it's a good idea to do igra. If it is positive, it is TB. Treat for TB. If it is negative, give TNF.
clear so i i'll just remove all the annotations now just look at this flow chart pause the video look at this flow chart and slowly and slowly this flow chart will start to make sense we don't have to remember anything or everything it all it is all it all makes sense any risk factors look at any active tv if you find it three to four tv if no give prophylaxis and then give dnf alpha if there are no risk factors do a monto test if monto test is more than 15 or it shows inflammatory activity treat as active active tuberculosis if it is less than is uh, 15 but more than 10 do igra if igra is positive it is tb treat for tb if igra is negative give anti tnf alpha if it is less than 10 look at the risk factors if risk factors are present do an igra to confirm if it is positive treat as tb if negative give tnf alpha if risk factors are not there give tnf alpha clear I hope it makes sense. Just keep looking at this flow chart. I will share the citation of the original article so that you can go and read the full article. It's a good article. Go through it. Now malignancy. Malignancy is second black box warning for dalimumab. Most common malignancies include lymphomas, mainly Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Nearly everywhere where lymphoma is a side effect, these two culprits always come. Hodgkin, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Clear? Non melanoma skin cancers like BCC and SCC have also been reported, and the risk significantly increases if adalimumab is used with additional immunosuppressants, let's say with like with corticosteroids or methotrexate. Okay, so if additional, just pardon my sleepiness, it's 2 30 a.m. Okay, so if additional immunosuppressants are being used, the risk for malignancy significantly increases. Clear? So remember two black box warnings, severe infection and malignancies. Other side effects. Inject site reactions, I have already told you, roughly 20% of patients will have allergic reactions like urticaria, hives can occur and are severe enough to cause anaphylaxis. If any of this happens, anaphylaxis, you cannot give TNF alpha inhibitor, especially a map again. Uh, abandon it and search for other modalities. Hep B reactivation have been reported. Now in demyelinating disorders, in demyelinating disorders like multiple sclerosis, optic neuritis or Gwen Barre. Okay, so these two are centrally demyelinating disorders, Gwen Barre is peripheral demyelinating disorders. So if, if any demyelinating disorders is present, it, a dalimumab should be avoided. And the package insert mentions that adalimumab has to be uh, avoided even if first degree relative has a history of demyelinating disorder. So if any of the first degree, degree blood relation has demyelinating disorders, avoid adalimumab. Okay. If any neurological symptoms develop in your patient who is receiving adalimumab, stop adalimumab. Okay. If any neural symptoms which are suggestive of demyelinating disorders, in your patient who is receiving adalimumab, stop adalimumab. Clear? Now, cytopenias are rare. Congestive heart failure. Now, this is very important. It is one of the important absolute contraind, uh, somewhat of a relative contraindication. Adalimumab has to be used if the disease is severe. In congestive heart failure, you have to take a cardiac clearance. It, uh, this side effect is significantly mentioned in package insert. Uh, so be very careful in using patient in patients who have uh, heart disease or congestive heart failure and congestive heart failure can also develop while on therapy clear so keep your mind open regarding congestive heart failure now autoantibodies what are autoantibodies any monoclonal antibody whenever injected into body is nothing but foreign protein even if it is human derived like adalimumab, it is a foreign protein. Our immune system will recognize any foreign protein. When, when our immune system recognizes any foreign protein, they will form their own antibodies against these. And these antibodies will attach itself and neutralize it. Clear? And when these monoclonal antibodies like adalimumab are neutralized, this will lead to loss of efficacy of adalimumab. So roughly about 8% of patients do develop autoantibodies. However, this, there is not much significant reduction in clinical efficacy as compared to other biologicals like infliximab. 
but there is certain reduction in efficacy of dalimumab because of autoantibodies. So multiple times adalimumab is combined with methotrexate and methotrexate prevents the development of these autoantibodies. But remember when you give methotrexate with adalimumab, you are significantly increasing the chances of malignancy and serious infections. So be very careful. Lupus like illness because of autoantibodies have been reported in 3 to 12 percent of patients. So that is also one of the side effects. Paradoxical psoriasis. Now it's called paradoxical because TNF alpha inhibitors are given to treat psoriasis, but in few isolated cases, it has been shown that treatment with TNF alpha inhibitors can also cause psoriasis. So that is what is known as paradoxical psoriasis, and it is seen in 1.5 to 5 percent of patients. Okay. So remember, all TNF alpha inhibitors have been known to cause psoriasis paradoxically, and this is known as paradox uh, paradoxical psoriasis, seen in 1.5 to 5 percent of patients undergoing adalimumab therapy. Vaccinations. If you are using it for pediatric patients, now it has not been approved for any pediatric dermatosis, but it is FDA approved for pediatric ulcerative colitis, pediatric Crohn's disease. So in those patients, make sure that all of your pediatric patients are brought up to date with all immunization. Okay, they may receive any concurrent vaccination, but no live vaccination. So just remember, you cannot give your patient live vaccines. Otherwise, you have a severe risk of reactivation of in these infections because of these vaccines. So no live vaccines and if you are using in pediatric population, make sure they are up to date with their vaccinations. Clear? Drug interactions. Methotrexate. Remember that I have already told you that methotrexate is added to adalimumab so that the autoantibodies are not formed. If you add the the levels of adalimumab is significantly reduced. One article mentioned as much as 70% reduction. Okay, I did not find any other reference for this, so I am not mentioning it. 70% reduction. Okay, so methotrexate reduces levels, but no dose adjustment is required. The regimen remains the same. It is 80, 40, 40, or 160, 80, 40, 40, depending on the dermatosis. Okay, so methotrexate prevents any autoantibodies, but it also reduces the levels of adalimumab but no dose adjustment is required, okay? Other TNF alpha inhibitors, Anakinra, Avatacept have no added benefit or uh, they don't give, they don't provide additional benefit. On the other hand, they may increase the chances of infections and malignancies. So do not combine with the TNF alpha, okay? Now see a cytochrome 450 substrate. Substrate means cytochrome 450 is an enzyme all the substrate of that enzymes might be increased. So many immunosuppressive drugs like azathioprine or cyclosporin require cytochrome P450 for their action. And if cytochrome P450 is reduced to some extent, this may lead to activation, uh, this may lead to decreased efficacy of these drugs. Okay. And Inflammatory cytokines like TNF alpha, interleukin 6, they all suppress cytochrome P450. So, if cytochrome P450 is suppressed, it may not attach itself to these substrates and lead to efficacy. Okay. So, in presence of TNF alpha, CYP450 is reduced, CYP450 reduces the other drugs like acetylene and cyclosporine. Remember that. Other substrates also, ketoconazole, warfarin, a lot of substrates are there. Now, in pregnancy, not much data is available. The newer guidelines say that it is low risk. The older guidelines have given it category B. Birth defects in one study was found to be 10% in, in mothers who had received adalimumab. So mothers, when they receive adalimumab, birth defects in children uh, during the first trimester of organogenesis formation is found to be in 10% compared with placebo Placebo had 7.5% and Adalimumab had cohort had 10%. And this difference was not found to be statistically significant. Okay. So if the patient is pregnant and they actually require Adalimumab in your opinion, you may give Adalimumab, but keep an eye on the fetal health and maternal health. Now transfer does happen through placenta in the third trimester and it can decrease the immune response of the baby. So in the third trimester, in third trimester, 
system. A dilemma can cross the placenta and reach the baby. Let's see. Through the baby. So, a dilemma can reach the baby and being an immunosuppressive agent, it may decrease any immune responses that the baby might have, thereby increasing the chances of neonatal infection. Also, increases the chances of reactivation of infection when live vaccines are given. Additionally, even if killed vaccines are given, the seroconversion is affected because the body is not able to amount, surmount a good immune response because they received a lymph from the mother. Clear? In lactation, it has found that 0.1% to 1% of serum adalimumab is, is secreted in breast milk and that can reach the baby. However, it is a large molecule, cannot cross the intestinal barrier and it is destroyed in the gastrointestinal tract. So, whether the efficacy of adalimumab through, which gets transferred through breast milk has any bearing on the immune system of the baby has not been documented. So, it is of somewhat safer in lactating mothers. Am I clear on that? Good. Now with that, I finished my presentation on adalimumab. So with this presentation, you will know a bit about what is adalimumab, uh, what are the mechanisms of action, what are the serious adverse events to be taken care of, what are the different regimen in psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, HS, and it might give uh, might help us in understanding the disease process and also when to use it, where to use it, how to better help our patients. If you have any doubts, any suggestions, any queries, you comment below the video. I'll, I'll see and reply to each and every comment. If you have good questions, ask them. If you have any other questions that have been asked regarding a dialogue map in your vivas, ask us so that we uh, can find answers and everybody will benefit from it. You can email me directly at this email. Now remember that if any monoclonal antibody name is ending with suffix mumab or umab it is humanized hum okay so umab is humanized this uh, so, sorry human derived so umab adali umab is human derived okay so with that this presentation ends and we have finished the first biological to be discussed adali umab we'll meet again next week then we'll be discussing the next biological. Till then, adios, bye-bye and good night.